We'd like to welcome Richard to the morning phone and 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 Natalie McKenna. Okay. Once again, uh, welcome everyone to Tuesday morning. Well, do we have anyone that's here for the very first time? Except for our guests, they will introduce themselves. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning. My name is Norman Garns. I'm here for the first time. Uh, I was invited by Miss Sheriff. Uh, and I'm going to explain what, what I came now with the way later. Later. Okay. Hey, Norman. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi everyone, my name is Destiny Jarm. I'm a health reporter with Q City Metro. We cover black things going on in Charlotte, so I focus and cover on black health. Okay, we have with us this morning uh, Chris Brigham, Chief Program Officer at Image, and we have Rebecca Rowe, founder of the 2018 Let's Talk About It Autism Center, and we also have Dr. Tempest Lee, who's an educator, author, and the mother of an autistic child. Uh, welcome, and thank you for being here. Uh, we'd like to start it off with a word of prayer, and I'd like to ask you to uh, lead a bit of prayer. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm anxious to find out what the black things are. <laughs> but uh, I'll wait. Let's bow our heads and pray together, please. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for our love. We realize that you are always near us. Father, bless our nation. Bless our children everywhere. Bless our decisions makers. Help them to realize that we need a law, a rule, a change when it comes to who can buy, who can handle, even ask for a gun in society today. Father, keep us focused. Bless our state, bless our county, bless our city, our neighborhoods, and our homes. Bless this session today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Let us say together. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for being, yes, for being here. And just to share with you, uh, being one of the facilitators for the two school, we have, as I mentioned, we have several. What we like to do is do it in order to do it and I explain to you. I explained to Chris when he came in. It was only two or three people in here, and I said, We don't know who's going to come. We sent out an invitation to many people to come to our pool because we just share information. So people will be coming in respectfully and they will be moving respectfully. But we facilitate uh, the process, in, which is just you would do a presentation. Each one of you share about five minutes to share information, five to six, seven minutes to share information about you and what you do um, on the subject matter that we're discussing today, after which we would open it up for questions and answers for the people uh, in the audience now. And just to share with you, this is, we do have to do it by live stream, and we're on Facebook Live, and this is recorded, and it, you know, it's kept with Steve, and he's um, person that keeps up the phone together and sends out the information. So uh, we will allow, we ask people to show, by show of hands, they want to ask a question, so we try to be fair and identify those that have questions. And they may direct them to you and we, we uh, to individuals, or uh, all of you, to answer the questions, and they usually specify that. Uh, and once they ask that question, we ask them to give us a minute to give, give him a minute or less to ask that question and give you maybe two to three minutes to answer, particularly if all of you have to answer the question. 
that's the way we facilitate um, as we move. And we try to keep it as orderly and respectfully as we possibly can. We do not do any debates. And um, as Richard slash Winston, <laughs> Winston asked us to uh, let's take a moment, silence, silence, silence. <laughs> So we don't have interruption there. So without any further ado, um, we'll start with Dr. Reed. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, as she said, my name is um, Tempest Lee. I have been in education for 16 years. I was a high school science teacher for seven years, and then I was an instructional coach and an assistant principal at a middle school for four years, which was exciting. And um, I've also, um, here recently, I've been at UNC Charlotte as a new teacher support coach. So I've been in school buildings working with brand new teachers. Um, as she mentioned, I am a mother of an autistic child. I'm very familiar with um, people with special needs. My grandmother had three children um, out of her 10 that had special needs. Um, I also have an aunt that has a daughter that has special needs. So I've been familiar with kids with special needs, but. Being, becoming a parent of a child with special needs has been a new journey for me. And also seeking out resources has been a challenge for me as well. I'm currently in Union County. Um, I've been sitting here next to um, one of the panelists just learning more about what um, Charlotte Mecklenburg has to offer. But I'm here to advocate for more resources for all children for, that have special needs inside of the public school system and outside of the public school system. Um, Recently, my son, who is um, in the sixth grade, he's neurotypical, um, he wrote a book about his experience with his brother and how he's had to grow and learn how to interact with his brother who has autism. My youngest has autism. He's eight years old. So um, it's been a journey in teaching and learning about all the things that are out here and all the things that are not present that are needed in order for us to be able to support kids of all learning abilities and adults of all learning abilities and teaching those that are neurotypical how to be more accepting of those that have disabilities as well. I'm, uh, my name is Chris Bergman and I work for InReach. I've been with InReach for 30, 31 years. So um, it's pretty much my sole career right out of college. Um, and we are, our mission basically, we're a provider agency and our mission is to be a leader in providing innovative housing, employment, community services um, to, sort people within, to support people with intellectual disabilities and other disabilities in their families. So um, like I said, intellectual disabilities are examples would be Down syndrome, um, autism, um, cerebral palsy. So those types of disabilities is the population that our organization focuses on. Um, I can feel for the struggle that you're having. I speak to families every day. Um, we are primarily um, in Mecklenburg, but we do provide services in other counties. We're in Union, Cabarrus, Stanley, Davidson. Um, but, you know, depending on the county you're on, it, there's a different service array that a provider may offer. So we do offer the full array of services in Mecklenburg County for individuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities. Um, but we may be more limited in other counties in regards to the services that we provide. And that's where those other resources and funding sources are important. Um, so, yeah, I'm happy to be here today. And um, uh, hopefully I can share some information that will be helpful. And um, thank you. Good morning. My name is LeBecky Rowe. And I am a parent of a young adult who is on the autism spectrum. I have a graduate certificate in autism across the lifespan. I am the executive director, founder and executive director of Let's Talk About It, the Autism Center. And I started the organization because I remember back when my son was diagnosed in 1998. And so if you can think back to 1998, computers were just coming out on the market. So the resources that are available today were not available back then. So I had to find my way. Myself and my family had to find our way as to the resources that were available back then. And the only thing that was available back then was a neurologist 
and becoming a part of a case study. And that's what I did with my son. And if I listened to what the neurologist told me and what the case study doctor told me, I, I would have lost all faith and believed in what they said. But my faith taught me that I had to, I had to advocate for my son and I had to find the resources that were there. Or for me, I had to meet him where he was and help him to achieve. So today I stand before you and I say, in starting, let's talk about it, the autism center, I started it so that I could be a resource for the parents who are out here today and to let them know that they are not alone in the journey of autism. And since starting the organization, we have helped so many parents find their way because we know with autism, there comes behaviors. And sometimes we don't know what to do when we find that our child is acting in a way that other kids don't. So what do you do? You try to find help. We, I have been able, so today, as a retired New York City police officer, I get the opportunity to facilitate workshops with police on how to engage with our persons with autism should they encounter the ministry. My, my organization has, we have, been, we have been a recipient of the United Way grant so that we can further our cause in the community. We have a podcast that we do and you can, it's called Autism in Color. You can listen to it on Spotify, iHeart, Google, and Apple. Also, we do a support group every first and third Thursday of the month, and it's done virtually. And if you check out our website, our website is let's talk about it, theautismcenter.org. Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions? Winston? Uh, good morning. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I did not know you were a police officer. <laughs> uh, my question is, um, what are signs or indications or how could you support uh, people living with autism at that age where they're ready to kind of transition and find a life on their own? What are the best things you can do to kind of facilitate those desires for them to uh, end it? Okay. <laughs> I would say the process starts from little, right? So throughout the life, as they're growing up, you are in, you don't want to enable them. You want to help them to be able to do things on their own. So you teach as time, you teach them as you go along, right? Just like any typical kid, you, you teach them the same things. You teach them how, how to bathe themselves, how to wash dishes, how to clean up after themselves, how to make their bed. You teach them the ways of the world. When you go out into the community, you allow them to make purchases so they'll know how to count their change, how to give money, how to wait for their change, how to stand in line. Because sometimes our kids have with boundaries. Right? We have to teach them boundaries. It's like you can't stand too close. And I mean, a lot of people need to learn boundaries, right? right? <laughs> but we do have to teach our kids the step by step. And it's learn, you learn by doing, right? Progress e equals success. Once they master this, you move to the next thing. And it may be you have to one out of two tries, three out of five tries, something like that. And you, and you may have to, I'm looking for my wording, it's called, you have to take steps, there are steps. Trial, yes, it's trial and error, and yeah, it's trial and error. You got that um, Sure, um, my son is only eight, but one thing that I would encourage family community to do is just to advocate early as possible. Don't ignore the signs. As soon as you can start putting interventions in place, looking for those resources so that they can get to the point where you can start inputting those um, strategies, build community. Okay. Um, I know back in the day, you know, we used to keep 
those that had disabilities isolated. We didn't bring them out in public as much, but now you see them more at the store and at the park and at games. So making sure that they are interacting with um, their peers, um, encourage them to be independent, like she was saying, all of that starts young. We can't ignore it and then all of a sudden expect them to jump um, and have these milestones late. And then like I was saying, just don't isolate them um, when they're young, give them all the opportunities that you can while they're young. And from a provider perspective, um, what I've learned and a lot of what I've learned is working with um, families like you all because each child is different. Um, and the first thing I wrote down was the early intervention. So the, what I've learned over the years is that those ABA therapies and um, that early intervention and um, trying to develop, you know, skill setting as early as possible really I think there's data that shows that their, their progress, it really ex exponentiates their progress or, you know, creates greater progress for each child. But also, you know, our job is to provide supports as an agency. So we work with families and we listen to families. So we would look at your situation, your child, what you're trying to accomplish and try to put the supports in place, you know, be it, if it's respite to give the family a break so that they can take care of themselves a little bit or if it's to support with therapies to help the child learn and grow, that would be our, our function. But definitely the early intervention. And also when children are having behaviors or even adults with disabilities, um, what a lot of people need to really keep in mind is if, if there's some type of behavior they're exhibiting, it's for a reason. And they may not have the verbal or communication skills to express appropriately or you know what they're feeling so the the acting out is really coming from something so the key is to figure out what what are they trying to communicate and then work around that if i can add to that when, when you see sometimes we see a kid we see a kid who's on the spectrum and we see the behavior but we don't know what the antecedent was mm -hmm. and so we look at the behavior and we want to we want to say you know we, we ask why are you doing that but what we need to do is find out what happened prior to the behavior. Could it have been they walked into a room and the lighting is not good because our nonverbal kids unable to, are unable to tell you what's going on, right? And I like to tell, I, I say to parents, although our kids cannot communicate with us verbally, but if, if they can write or if they have an augmented device, you can let them use that to kind of explain what they are feeling and show pictures, use pictures because pictures are best when it comes to our kids on the spectrum, no matter whether they're verbal or nonverbal, no matter the age, because it helps them to identify what they are feeling and what's really going on within them. Okay, um, before we, we do have um, Siobhan is next and then Kim, but before we do, can we have, um, Chris, could you explain to us the spectrum? Because I think that's a, a term that we use a lot, and I don't think everybody understands the spectrum. Yes, and I am not an expert or clinician. I'll just put that out there. But okay. uh, for, over my 30 years, what I have come to understand is, and again, every child is different, especially with autism. Um, it's I've, I've had the, the fortunate um ability to meet lots of families and lots of different kids and amazing kids. And I've seen um, a range of different levels of autism, I guess, is, you know, I'm, I may not be using the right wording either, <laughs> but, but, it, but it is a range of um, the level of the disability. Right. And some people are more profound and some people can be, you know, like a higher functioning level. Right. That early intervention does help, we believe, with that progress. Um, but a good example would be I, I uh, had a family we worked with. I, like I said, I've been around for 30 years, and they, the, the mother had a um, child with a disability, could not, um, had to actually isolate him in his room sometimes for his own safety. And um, this is, you know, lock him in his room. Um, and over the years, this individual has progressed to the point that they're riding the bus, they have their own apartment. They're living in the community independently. Um, so, you know, I don't know if that answers your question directly about the spectrum, but you have, I think, yeah, you Lebecca, can elaborate you can, a little more. I can kind of answer it. So, you know, we, we talked about Asperger's and high functioning autism. Mm -hmm. So, so the DSM-5, which is a diagnostic medical code book where 
psychologists and doctors get their, their, their numbers from to diagnose, right? And so now they've diagnosed it as level one, level two, and level three. Mm -hmm. So level three is more profound, as he stated, mm -hmm. and level one is high functioning. However, our high functioning individuals can have level two tendencies and level two tendencies could be every Wednesday, I go to Sam's club and Susan is there and she's serving the cracker with um, peanut butter on it. And so this is what we do every Wednesday. So now this Wednesday we go there, Susan is not there. No one told me that Susan wasn't going to be there. And so now I will have a meltdown. But I'm high functioning, but still, I still have autism and that's, that's what we have to understand. And so that's a behavior that you may see in an individual who is high functioning, mm -hmm. but still I have, I am structured, I'm rigid and organization is everything for me. And no one told me. And you know, I have, we have an individual we work with, we support currently and his form of, and it, it is so different, it's hard to explain. Mm -hmm. His form of autism is, um, very, very intelligent guy, gets around the community, rides the bus, but he is organization, you're right. Yes. And he cannot have anything in cabinets. We had to take the doors off the cabinets. Mm -hmm. Everything is out and organized. Sugar packets are here. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. It, it's just like, and that we've had to support him to live in his apartment that way. And it's a little unorthodox, but it works. It works for him. It works for him. Um, we just have to make sure it's clean and safe. He has, he can get out. It's not too cluttered or, you know, there's nothing blocking the doors. But he's very particular about like all the yes. shirts have to be on out of the yes. drawers on the floor. Yeah. So yes. it's just a very unique and interesting disability. Really. Yes, and it's their way. And uh -huh. it's not wrong. It's just no. that's who I am. It fluctuates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a day to day thing and it fluctuates. Sometimes my son come can come home and he will speak to me in full sentences. And sometimes if he's triggered, he will just scream. So it just it varies from day to day and that's why as they were saying, it's, it's a spectrum because where they are is not where they always remain. It fluctuates depending on the triggers that um, they may encounter. And what we try exactly. to do is be proactive to address them so they can be successful in, that, in, in the space where they are and continue to grow in progress. Yeah. He's closing now. Okay, Siobhan. I was going to ask, I know you all were talking about, um, and I came in a few minutes late, so I apologize. But um, traffic, <laughs> but um, you all were talking about uh, like that transitional period when they're uh, that's maybe leaving the supports of schools and going into you know their young adult life. Are there agencies? I'm assuming you you're a part of an agency where they help in those transitions. So are there people who, if they haven't learned some things, because some parents keep the kids more sheltered and they they may not know a lot of different things that other kids might have learned mm -hmm. with autism. Are there agencies that support that part of it where they go into the community and teach them how to purchase things and you know those kind of life skills that we all need as we go into adulthood? There are and that that is those are services, community based services that we do provide. Um, there are challenges into accessing services we were discussing earlier. A lot of the services you, you need to have Medicaid um, to qualify. There are some state funding and county services as well, but not as not as many as there need to be. Um, the Medicaid services are the main ones. But yes, there are um, there are also um, interventions in school. I know, and you two may be able to speak more to this, but I know there's an IEP process where the, yes. the school you know creates a plan to help develop whatever supports that they can provide within the school setting and work towards his the mm -hmm. child's transition. There's also a new service, mm -hmm. care management, that the state brought back. And it is, again, a Medicaid service. But I would yeah, encourage families to definitely get a care manager because um, a care manager can work with children and adults. So they could be your advocate and support within the school and be a part of the IEP process. They could also link you to agencies like InReach, like us, or some community-based services um, and some respite um, so that, yeah, you could get the respite yes, for the parents, but also some of the supports in the community to teach some learning, yes. like, um, you know, independent living skills and how to shop or just even to go and um, socialize. Socialization, I think, is, um, you, you both can elaborate 
uh, more if you feel so, but I feel like socialization is really important for kids with autism and really working on that piece. Yeah. I think socialization is easy for easier for our kids when they are in elementary, middle school, and high school. But it's once you get outside of that, mm -hmm. yeah, it's hard. Mm -hmm. It is be hard for our kids. Yeah, I don't know about people. And um, another thing I'll add: um, services are there's an oversight agency depending on the county you live in. Beck Lindbergh and Union Alliance is the service that manages all of the the state and Medicaid funding for the providers like us. So um, they would probably be the first place to go, would you agree, to kind yes. of get an assessment of what services are available to you? And they should have a list of, or they do have a list of providers and care management agencies that you can contact. And you can also go through voc vocational rehab. Yes. I, I think once your kid turns 16, you can start looking into vocational rehab and getting testing and moving, just moving along in the process of adulthood, moving towards adulthood. That's an excellent point. It doesn't require Medicaid. Right. ER is state funded. So yeah, you can get some psychological testing and start working towards, um, I think they have independent the living and vocational, yes, right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. And if your child has an IEP, like be very active in being a part of the IEP process, a lot of our students that have special needs will qualify to have an extended period in high school where it goes beyond 18. Um, a lot of the programs, every school district should have a program where they teach them those types of skills and they take them out into the community and they learn how to do all those types of things. But you have to be intentional about making sure that those things are placed into their IEP as a goal. And if you need to get an advocate, like someone that is familiar with doing IEPs, I've sat on both sides of the table and yes. just being familiar with the language that they That's use, yes. you're really going to have to be able to advocate for mm -hmm. um, your child and what you know they're going to need to learn so they can be placed in the specific classroom that is actually going to teach them those skills because mm -hmm. otherwise they may be placed in a room where, where they're not receiving that. So make sure you advocate and look at every document that is written if your child is in that you know, that stage between 16 and 21, where mm -hmm. they can continue to receive services from um, your public school system. And if I can add to that, uh, IEP, I know we're using IEP, but it's an individualized yes. educational plan. And I say to parents, you are your child's biggest advocate. Yes. If yes. you feel it necessary to call IEP meeting, then call that IEP meeting. If, if that IEP is not being met, you make sure that they know that you ex what, your, what your expectations are, and don't be afraid. And in regard to in regard to the transition piece, it's important as well. Um, a lot of services require um, psychological testing with an adaptive, and the adaptive testing really just shows deficits in life areas that the child may need to work on. It could be like um, mobility. Um, uh, independent living skills, socialization, those types of things. But that would be important to have once they transition from high school to like a community provider, for example, in reach. Because yes. um, Alliance will, um, that's how they uh, qualify people or establish eligibility. Okay, Ken, thank you. Uh, you've been around, you say, 30 years. I listed on the way in. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 30 years, so you may know uh, the answer that I have. We'll see. <laughs> uh, at Morganton, North Carolina, mm -hmm. at Broadton, I believe, my mm -hmm. yes. uh, I happen to have had the occasion to work with a young man mm -hmm. uh, who was autistic, but his artwork was exceptional. Mm -hmm. And his artwork was sold for thousands of dollars, but yet he was institutionalized. Yeah. Uh, with the combination of to his talent and skill, mm -hmm. how and when do you discover? an autistic child's exceptional talent skills compared to when do you, or if you ever decide to determine the institutional residency is required. Yeah. And I'm curious if, uh, I might know the individual because there's been some uh, shows in Morganton, you remember Stage Studio 11? I don't know if you're familiar with them, but um, that's an art studio that specialized in um, promoting um, artists with disabilities. And we we partnered with them a few years ago and did some art shows. So um, I I don't know that I'm the most appropriate person to answer that in regards to when to identify. I would think as early as possible, but 
really the experts I've found over the years are the parents. The parents know their yeah. children and um, what their skills are. Yeah. So I could kind of speak to that. Before my son, my son was my, my son is 28 years old. So my son was nonverbal in the very beginning. And I know today because he was nonverbal, he was diagnosed with severe autism. However, today he's diagnosed with level one, level two tendencies, right? And so I knew that he could sing from the early on. Music was his thing. And so I'm from New York City. When I moved to Charlotte, I got him involved in music. And it took off from there. So he was able to participate in talent shows, musicals, plays, high school graduation, singing. So all these things he had within him. And I saw them. And so what I did was I made, I gave him the opportunity to showcase it. I followed his lead. And that's what I want parents to do because our kids, they do have a talent, whether it's art, music, what history, sports, whatever it is, they have it. And it's, it's up to the parent to find it and make sure they are able to showcase it. Yeah, and my son, he's only eight, but he's very, very musically inclined. Yes. He can pick up a beat, like, he'll pick up anything and make drumsticks out of it and can mimic. Yes. He can memorize movies and act them out from beginning to end. Yes. But you may sit down with him and say, let's, let's write our name, and he'll get frustrated with that. But there are things that, like she said, that they're exceptional with, and that's what you have to nurture and cultivate, mm -hmm. and then leave space for the other things. So it can be identified very, very early on, but like she said, it's up to the parent to really advocate for that person and kind of nurture whatever that is that they can kind of live and exist in that makes them happy. And I can elaborate in regards to things that we've done to support creativity at InReach. We, um, we have a pottery program, so we have a lot of folks that participate in that and create pottery, and we sell it in the community. Yeah. And um, we also have a theater troupe, yeah. so we have some folks that like to act. So we've created, it's a puppet show, and then like really nice puppets, like Jim Henson looking puppets. And um, it's uh, pre-recorded, and it's a message about inclusion and diversity, and they travel around and present this puppet show. And those, those folks love that. We have music um, classes. We have writing um, classes for our folks in our day program. We also have a guy um, uh, that we've hired that's an individual with autism. He's um, actually went to college, graduated with a music degree, and he is phenomenal. He can play like the guitar, the piano. He writes his own music. And um, we've worked with him to do music classes. So he, he'll, a lot of our folks in our day program, he'll do a class once a week and he'll do like name that tune, you know, where he'll play right. music and then they have to guess the song and they love it. Oh my God. But so th those are some ways we're trying to um, create um, creative opportunities for folks, but it really is the parents that know their child and know what their skills are. And then our job is to wrap around the parent and provide the supports to enhance your child to the best we can. Okay, and back here in the yeah, it's your turn. Well, no, I mean, her, it's in the back, yeah, it's her turn. And I put you on the list, okay? So I was wondering, you guys I got you, I have you. But have, is, have you all seen a discrepancy or disparity when black children are diagnosed and have the access to resources that they receive versus when white children are diagnosed, when they're diagnosed and the access to resources that they receive, there's something to talk about. Um, being in the education system, um, I started teaching in 2007. Um, once you've been around people that have disabilities, you know a lot of the signs, symptoms, things to look for, deficits to look for, sitting in IEP meetings when you know that there may be a, a wrong diagnosis or a misdiagnosis. It is very evident. I know, um, and I can speak to you know my own personal experience. A lot of times, people of color have a hard time accepting that there is a disability present and identifying it and taking their child to the doctor to get them a test that needs to be done. Um, it's not often talked She's about if the child has a disability, so they're not always seeking, you know, building community because I've had a hard time finding community um, where I am. So um, there is a lot of discrepancy. I do see more parents that are white advocating for their child if they have disabilities than I do for those that are, um, that are not. 
But I do believe that there are a lot of students that are or kids that are misdiagnosed or not diagnosed and could be receiving more services so that their, ch their children can progress. But it takes the parent being there to advocate for those things because the child cannot advocate for themselves when it comes to those things. And we, you know, as educators, as teachers, we try to advocate and do as much as we can, but it takes a village, it takes the parents, it takes the community, it takes um, the teachers coming together to put those resources together for that child. So I do see a discrepancy when it comes to that from what I've experienced in education. And I'm hoping that through spaces like this and conversations like this, we can begin to advocate more for all, all students. Okay, and right here, yes. Thank you all for being here. I'm and then you're next. Um, I just wanted to uh, make two comments. Uh, in reach, mm -hmm. I've been a supporter of in reach for a while, and you guys do amazing work. Um, I have a friend, Eric, who is at the CNBC store at the airport. Okay, yeah. He's been mm -hmm. supported by you all. Um, he's been working there since 2018. And he oh, wow. loves his job. Mm -hmm. He takes it very seriously. He is a very dependable employee. <laughs> and um, we all have a great job with him. Um, Rosie's Coffee Up the Road on North Davidson has, I believe, an art exhibit of work from um, clients of InReach. Oh. So if you all had uh, a chance to take a look, look. It's, uh, it's a great exhibit. Uh, two questions. Medicaid expansion. Do, do you have an idea of a long-awaited Medicaid expansion in North Carolina? Do you have an idea of how that will impact your um, uh, people that you work with? And um, is there any uh, idea as to the cause of autism? With the Medicaid expansion, I can start with that. And I am still trying to tease that out myself and understand the ramifications of how that will um, um, affect our um, industry. From what I understand, um, it will, there is a possibility we may have more innovation slots. Um, there'll be an increase in the number of, of, and innovations for, I don't know if everyone's familiar, but there's different Medicaid services that are available in North Carolina. And um, Innovations is a waiver service that is a very comprehensive, rich array of services. Um, there's currently a wait list. I think, I want to say, I don't want to get this wrong, but there's thousands of people. Do you know the exact number? It might be 15,000, but there's a lot of people on the wait list, and it takes years to actually get an Innovations waiver slot. Um, I'm hoping with Medicaid expansion, we'll get more of uh, opportunity for people to access that service, one potential, potentially positive thing. Also, if the state transitions to more Medicaid or has more Medicaid dollars, that may help save some of the state dollars that could be freed up to use to support folks with disabilities. We are fortunate in um, Mecklenburg to have some state dollars for some of our services at InReach. But as we were discussing, um, I don't know that there's as much in Union. So maybe some of these other counties could have access to possibly more state dollars um, for, to enhance services that are already there. Um, so, and then what was the other question? I'm sorry. What was his autism? That I do not know. You, you, I would defer to you on that if you have any information on that. <laughs> From what I've learned, autism can, it, it can run in families. It can occur, it can be a first occurrence in that, in that particular child that you have. And just environmental. Mm -hmm. We don't know. We just don't know. I, I actually had genetic testing done on my son, and we found out that he actually had some deletions. Um, so, like, you know, with your DNA, you have different parts that code for different things, and he has deletions on several strands of his DNA, and that's what kind of manifested his autism. Yes. But um, sometimes it, it's not even that. It can, like she said, it can be environmental issues and stress. There are so many different reasons and so many unknown things that a lot of times a lot of parents just don't know why. So that's why it's not something that's easy to treat or easy to um, kind of resolve some of the issues that this, the children are having because there's no way to pinpoint the cause of it. So that's why all these different supports are in place with the OT, the speech, the ABA, and all the trial and error that you have to do because there is no way to 
pinpoint the actual cause of all of the occurrence of autism. And I think I was going to mention something um, here. This question. Go ahead. I, I like, <clears throat> excuse me, I like to say God chose us to be the parents of kids on the autism spectrum. We were the chosen ones. Yes. Yes. And, um, I have a nine year wait for wow. my son the last time I called when I got him set up for innovations. He's eight. So hopefully, you know, that his time progresses because we don't qualify for Medicaid. Um, we pay for a lot of our son's um, treatments and um, outside services out of pocket. Our insurance does not cover everything 100%. So if you don't qualify for Medicaid, it is extremely difficult mm -hmm. to pay for outside ABA. OT ABA can cost you $50, $30 an hour. And if you, some of them make you pay, make you have to have 15 minimum hours a week. So when you're paying for that out of pocket, it is almost, you have to have another job just to cover the services because you don't qualify. And then there's such a long wait for the services in North Carolina. So if you don't qualify for Medicaid, it's almost impossible to be able to provide all of the services you want to provide. That's why I say you have to make sure you um, stick to the IEP, include every service that the school can provide. Yes. So that can take some of the weight off of you because I know the school will provide OT speech if it's necessary for your child. They do not provide ABA or a lot of ABA into the schools and public schools. I would say that's one of the greatest barriers actually to services for a lot of folks. If you're a working family, it's hard. You have to have resources. And I've worked with families that mortgage their home to provide for the care of their child. Um, so yeah. And ABA is applied behavior analysis, and it's used to correct, right? Correct behavior that's good behavior, turn bad behavior into good behavior, for lack of a better word, when using the word bad. Okay. Thank you for the acronyms. <laughs> Every profession has them. So. Yes. We have way too many, yeah. <laughs> and I forget. I, we do at least too. correct me if I use them. <laughs> okay. Um, I have Nathalie and then Gary, Winston, Micah, Jackie, and Ken. Did you get to that? My question was oh, no. also about um, the daily update on what they have caused autism. But I also wonder because, um, you know, I grew up a long time ago, and there were always children that, that were different. So do you think it's really new or just finally somebody put a name to it? Mm -hmm. I think that someone put a name to it. And in my reading, it says they used to think that it was maternal, like whatever the mother is taking or whatever environment she's in. But I'm learning now that it's coming from the father. That's what they're saying. So, <laughs> I am not to blame for that. But in the reading, that's what it says. And, and I've seen that over and over and over again. But to answer your question about autism, I remember growing up, there was a young man that lived where I lived. And he was tall and he was kind of and he was stocky. And I remember his parents saying, He it's okay. It's okay. He's not gonna hurt you. But at the time, he was tall, he was nonverbal, and he would just rock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So I don't know. I'm a kid. He's a kid, he's a little older than me. But I was afraid. But now looking back today, I realized that he had autism. There's no doubt in my mind. And they institutionalized him. Mm -hmm. I was I was about to say back then a lot of folks were institutionalized. Yes. And now, you know, we're learning we can support people in the community. Yes. Um, they just folks just need the right supports to be independent and to they can live full and rich lives with support. Yes, with mm -hmm. support. And I think that early intervention is best. Because like I said earlier, if I had listened to the doctors, I had one lady tell me that my three and a half year old son, a neurologist, not lady, but a neurologist tell me that my three and a half year old son, or he's going to be, he is right now, he'll never know you left the room. And I had another doctor tell me that I should institutionalize my son because he has severe mm -hmm. autism. And I'm like, that's not an option. He has a family that loves him. And if I had given in to what they, what they said, and not advocated for my son to ensure that he could be great, 
right? Success looks different for us all. And he was able to, he's been able to graduate high school right here at CMS. And I have to say CMS did my kid right. Everyone else might not <laughs> agree with CMS, but CMS worked for us and he went on to Winthrop. Oh, and so, you know, and the ability to perform and do these different things. So don't give up on your kid. Get do everything that you can, as the doctor stated here, that she has to pay out of pocket. I had to pay out of pocket too. We paid out of pocket. You have to do what you have to do for your kid. But it was a struggle. Okay, um, thank you. We have Gary. Um, I don't feel as if this is going to be redundant reading between the lines of a few questions, but I'm happy to see about like eight people now. So, <laughs> do your expertise. Um, mm -hmm. with limited public resources, particularly around Medicaid requirement, do you see this issue being made systemically into a capitalistic and economic one rather than a social issue where systems are working cohesively together to better enable this demographic? Um, and then it seems, like you said, your child, you said he was diagnosed in 98? 1998. CMS is so different. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we, we became CMS in 2002. We moved here in 2002. And so, you know, I had to learn to work the system and I, you know, it got better. Yeah, it's changed here. But yeah, but I mean, but yeah, do you see this being okay. more of an economic and a capitalistic issue more than a social one? The barriers, as we were saying earlier, are definitely economic. I feel like if you don't have the resources, it's mm -hmm. a challenge. And it's a very kind of fragmented system, I would say. And it's a very... Uh, hard for, I mean, I've been around 30 years and we're going through managed care transition right now at the state level for all Medicaid services. Yeah, I'm confused. Like so I know families are struggling with like understanding, um, you know, what's happening in this, in the, in the industry, but can't believe. I would definitely say it, the more social programs and dollars are needed for mental health and disabilities across the board. Um, so I do think there's a need for more social programming. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but there are economic barriers for sure to um, for, for, for a lot of folks. I think that there are a lot of resources out here and, and, and it's up to the parent to find them because Google can be your best friend and you can find resources everywhere. I don't know if you all agree, but the resources are here. And because this resource doesn't work, you go to the next one. You, it's not going to always fit what you're looking for, but you can find them. And you have to believe, you can't jump from person to person to person to person. You have to give a chance to this resource if you believe in this resource like ABA or speech. And speech goes a long way. Speech teaches so, teaches different things. Socialization, how to hold a conversation. It's more than getting someone, teaching someone to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, depending on where you are. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a availability. <laughs> like Charlotte Mecklenburg, mm -hmm. there is an abundance of resources. Yes. Like I've learned about in Reach Today and your program today, which I am going to be looking up when I leave here. <laughs> but I moved from Stanley County to Union County because mm -hmm. I was put on a wait list for services because no one would come out there because there was no services there. If you live in a rural county that is not access to a major highway, it is very difficult to find services for your child with special needs. So we had to move somewhere where we will have more accessibility to be able to get access to those resources. I do believe that like when I first um, when I first got my son's diagnosis in 2016, there might have been a couple of ABA, but now ABA services have popped up all over the place because yes. they're not they're not in the school system. It's another, like you said, it's a way for them to provide a service, but they're making a lot of money off of the service yes, when it can be provided to the school system, and it should be, because it should not cost a child who has no control over how they come out um, to be able to get the services they need for a basic sound education, which is supposed to be provided for by all these all acts and laws that we have in place for education. That's right. And you're coming out of pocket for a lot ABA. of that. Okay. Saying, yeah. So, and that's the same thing with speech and OT. My son was getting bus from Albemarle to Norwood, which was like a 40 minute drive on a bus because you have stops oh, to go to a, a EC pre-K program because we didn't have one in my city. So mm. that 
can be a trigger as well for a child when he's been on a bus all day or he's hungry and he's on his way home because I couldn't drive him because I wasn't able to work on time. I have to work because I have to pay for the services. So there's a lot of um, equity issues when it comes to finding services for students with special needs, not just with autism, but with all, all special needs children. Okay. Imagine 1998. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, Winston and then Micah. Uh, just so it can be said out loud, uh, Woman. if you were, you know, if you had your way, what resources would you want to be there uh, on a systemic level to better support families uh, with people with autism or like how? to get better systemic responses from local government. Even like when you mentioned uh, police response, my mind just started going like, oh, what a, what a dental office is like, or just all of these things that we're just so used to that we we're not considering for people with autism. So how could a system better respond to the, the things that you may see with them? For our kids with autism, I would say introduce. Introduce. When they go to the barbershop for the first time, introduce that, that the clippers. Say, these are the clippers. Turn it on. Let them hear the noise. Let them touch it. It's the same thing at the dentist's office or the doctor's office. I, I say to parents, when you are taking your kid to an appointment, let them know seven days in advance you're going to see Dr. Winston, right? <laughs> you're going to see Dr. Like Winston. <laughs> You are going to see Dr. Winston for speech therapy, right? And so on Monday, you let them know. On Tuesday, as they get as it gets closer, you put it on the calendar. You let them know. You move you move it over. You move it over because you, you're getting close to the date, right? And so now, when they get there, they they know because you have made them you familiarize them with what was what is going to happen. Like, this is where we're going to be next Monday. What's today? Next Tuesday, this is what we'll be doing. So every day you've told them. So now they get there, you, you don't have no, you won't have a behavior. They won't act up. Bless you. They won't act out. They, they won't run or they won't scream. They won't cover their ears. All the, all, and, and no one asks us what are the signs and symptoms <laughs> of autism that you can see. Okay, Michelle. Um, I know that not Did he want? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did you want to? Oh, oh okay. mentioned. We'll come back. We'll come back. Is lifespan involved with you, and to what degree? And just as a note, looking back, I always feel that I saw lifespan noted in the past more so than it is now for you know for different reasons. If you would just comment on that. Oh, what does lifespan mean? No, I know. What lifespan has done? Is okay. it involved with you at all? I'm not sure. I like understand. The program. Lifespan. Lifespan's like a, it's an organization like Enreach. It's oh, so Lifespan is an organization like Enreach, but mm -hmm. when I talked about having a having a graduate certificate in life autism across the lifespan, so it's like from the beginning until into adulthood, and and the in the different things that we can do to ensure that our kids are capable and able. It, it is involved. Yeah, you know. Free or not. You said it again, I'm sorry. It, it, it is involved at all. Only because it was noted. Can I, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Are you referring to the lifespan of the child or lifespan of the organization? The organization. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So I do, are you affiliated with them at all? I am I not affiliated asking. with lifespan. You are right. next. I'm going to let him. So I was going to add on in regards to the previous question. Yeah, I want you to go ahead. I like the doctor's suggestion of having those therapies in school. I mean, I think that's just that that right there is a wonderful suggestion. And I know for us, um, we're currently like everybody else. We're in a staffing crisis, you know, trying to get staff to provide the supports for the families is a big challenge. And the state is working on it, but more funding really to pay the direct support professionals that are in the field. Because I feel like we need to value these people, and they need to be paid. And um, and I don't think our rates have been adjusted for years. And again, the state I think is working on trying to get those rates up, but more funding for those direct support frontline folks okay. is great. And then in regards to police officers, someone mentioned that, and I just wanted to highlight 
Um, one thing we are doing that, I, that I'm really proud of at InReach is we're doing, um, working with the police um, CIP program. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember what that acronym stands for, but it's their price. Go ahead. Right. So, yes, I, I, I also. We may have worked That's, with you on that. I don't know. Yes, okay. I facilitate workshops for police departments and other municipalities mm -hmm. in the area through with Crisis Intervention Team from Mecklenburg County. Thank you, Chris. We are in pro partnership <laughs> with them to, for me to facilitate a workshop on how to identify a person on the autism spectrum if they should encounter them in the community. And I talk about echolalia, echolalia and I talk about eloping. Mm -hmm. do, do you all know what elopement means for a child on the autism spectrum? Are they going to get married or something? No. <laughs> that, that's not going on to Vegas. No, elopement means our kids, uh, and, and I think it happens more so with our kids who are nonverbal, they will take off running. Mm -hmm. So if they've been to an area in a neighborhood, whether there's a pond, a park, a train, mm -hmm. if they, in their mind, it's fixed. Right, they're, they're fixated on going there. And so they're unable to tell a parent, hey, this is where I want to go. They just leave out of the house and they go. And so that's why we say, let your neighbors know, let the police department in the area know. If you see my kid yeah. out here, just know, I did not give them permission to be out here. And they're going wherever it is they're trying to go. And you have to be careful because they like the body of water and they go to this water and they could possibly drown. It has happened. Mm -hmm. It has happened with the train station. It has happened. It is real for our parents who have kids on the autism spectrum who get out of their home and they might find them in the neighbor's backyard, wherever it is, they're fixated on going, they're gonna get there and you will know nothing about it. And we've done similar programs and we may have, I don't know if we've been involved in, in, in similar programs or, um, with you or not, but we've invited, we do a luncheon and we invite the CIT officers. Oh, yeah. you, so you, yeah. yes, I bet. I, 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 that. Yeah, and so, that, so we've done that together yes. actually. Yes. And then we bring police officers and match them with folks that are in yes. their community. We show that. Right? And then they, uh, we've heard stories where they, they, when they're on the beat and out in the streets, they see the person and then they yes. like um, actually connected with them. So yes. yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's a great program. Yes. Okay, did, did, did they answer? Oh. Did we finish with? Winston's question before we move um, on. I just wanted to mention, I think insurance should cover any child that has mm -hmm. disabilities 100%. Yes. Um, as they would for any other medical condition. If the child has been diagnosed with a disability, that disability should be covered. The services should be covered. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm paying to insure my premiums every month. That. So we need mm -hmm. some kind of insurance reform because not all insurance covers all things mm -hmm. and they don't always cover all things 100%. As he was saying, the school system should be accountable for making sure that all the students in the building are getting access to all of the resources that they need. So that should be across the board as well. Yes. And I also think there needs to be training for everyone in, in the schools, like in schools, teach children that are normal functioning children <clears throat> how to and how to interact yes. with kids with disabilities. Yes. And I think they will be able to grow together mm -hmm. because that's what I've had to teach my son because my son didn't understand why his brother wouldn't want to play or why he didn't want to interact with him in a certain way. And when I taught him how to interact with his brother, then they were able to begin to build that bond because at first they weren't even communicating together. <laughs> Neither of them were able to you know, understand why but now my older son understands Definitely. how he needs to interact with his brother to be able to play and communicate and um, have that bond that they now have. So I think there needs to be training for adults and for students on how to interact with those that have disabilities. I agree. I think that the school, need, the school system needs to do a better job in having our Typical, so called typical kids engaging with our kids mm -hmm. who are on the autism spectrum because it could help, it, it can help both. It can definitely help both. Okay, we have one, two, three, four, five people already on the list, and we're getting close to our time, so we're going to try to do the best we can, okay? So, Jackie. Yes, um, I want to know are y'all familiar with the coffee shop that's over in the Thrift Road area? that works with um, persons who are autistic. And also, um, LaBecca, you, you asked us if we were familiar with two words. You told us elope. Elopement. 
eloping, but that wasn't there another word. Echolalia. And so sometimes you'll have kids who are learning to speak or who may be nonverbal. So what they do is they repeat what you say when you ask them a question. How are you? They say, how are you? What's your name? What's your name? Who are you here with? Who are you here with? And so it's, it's things like that. So you have to, you have to recognize that they're not understanding. Mm -hmm. And another misconception, someone asked about misconceptions. Because our kids are nonverbal does not mean that they do not understand. Please. So when you talk about them, know that they hear what you're saying and they understand, but they can't respond because I'm not verbal. Mm -hmm. And another way, my son has epilepsy. Yes. If you, if I ask him, are you feeling okay? Yes or no. He knows the difference between yes and no and thumbs up and thumbs down. Right. So after I ask him, are you feeling okay? Yes or no. He will say yes. Okay. So just if they're repeating you and if you can address it in a way where they can give you a clear yes or no response, I, it, it took some practice, but Absolutely. he was able was to say. identify that I was not wanting him to repeat what I was saying, but I needed to know yes or no or you know, good or bad of how he was feeling. Right. Okay. Yeah. I was gonna the coffee shop. In regards to the coffee shop, we are familiar and we have some folks that are working there. Um, we um, at NRH value vocational supports highly. Um, we have a very strong vocational department. Um, so we support people with on the job, um, looking for the job, training them on the job, and then we provide what's called follow along. So we provide a service where we go in and check with the manager, check with the staff check with the, the, the um, employee to make sure things going well. I did want to highlight real quick, I know we're running out of time, but we also have a really great um, internship program called Project Search. And um, it is a union, so we have one at Union County Hospital, but it is a program, it's an internship program through the high school. Some of them are through high schools, one is through Central Piedmont Community College, where um, the curriculum is overlaid with the job site. So um, we have three hospitals that we're in and one hotel. And the students go to the um, job site, the hospital or the hotel for curriculum. And then the afternoons they go out and they work jobs um, on the floor. So they, and they rotate, so they work in different departments. Hospital, they may work in OR, they may work in cafeteria, they may do patient transport, tele, whatever. So they get it to experience different job skills they come out of that program, and this is all through VR, so it doesn't require Medicaid funding, so that's another positive. Um, they come out of that program, and they have um, a resume, and they have recommendations from managers they work with. And it's a way to really um, support these folks with getting real-life work experience, um, getting references, and then that makes them more marketable to go out and get jobs. So then we can have job coaches that can work with them to actually you know, help place them in communities doing similar work skills in the community. So I just wanted to put that out there. And also with the elopement, real quick, there's a resource first in families and our coordinators here today, but they do, they are a flexible resource and have funding. There's one in Union and Mecklenburg, and they have helped families put fences in fences. so that it can help the child create a barrier so the child's safer. So um, just wanted to share that as well in regards to the elopement. Or causing alarms on your door, locks, you yeah. know, anything mm -hmm. to prevent them from getting out. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ken. In reference to uh, systemic uh, situations, my son just had a little boy that had some health issues at birth. And in speaking with him, he said it's night and day difference between where he is in Amsterdam and America. In America, the insurance companies dictate health care over there the doctors do and he is so appreciative of their system and how they operate uh, and in relations to the research on the causes of uh, autism uh, I don't know this to be fact but I suspect that uh, the conclusion that uh, men of the source uh, women probably did the research Oh, I'm no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my uh, comment is, you say God chooses yes, the special really. angels for his special children. And I had a flashback. I mentioned Morganton mm -hmm. earlier. That is plastered all over the place. And mm -hmm. for the last 42 years, I've heard references in autism. I've actually used it in, in a cadence, too. So uh, thank you for that uh, reminder mm -hmm. that it does take 
special angels to take care of God's special oh, yes, children. Absolutely. And I, to that, I, and if I can add, I, I wrote a book, um, and it's, 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 it's soon, it's, it'll be published soon, and it's called Spectrum of a Journey, and it's a guide for journal for the parents of children with autism spectrum disorder, because I know what it took for me to get where I am today, and so I wrote this book so that I can help other families who are on this journey of autism. Okay. Um, uh, 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 Thomas. Oh, did everybody? I just wanted to, to, to say something. Uh, a child is born, it's a child is born. The adult who comes into, the, into that child's space, that adult is transformed by the love that the adult has mm -hmm. for the child. Because when it gets difficult, the more difficult the child the more you grow. What I'm wondering is how have you grown? Because what, what, what's going on is we don't have a society full of people who are socially gifted and emotionally gifted. So they don't have the, the abilities that you have developed in connecting with your child. And, and so I'm just wondering what would you say because of your child you have grown in this area, this area, this area, this area. You think that you become an expert in? <laughs> For me, it was a strong faith in, 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 in to learn all that I needed to learn about autism and what his need was because he was dependent on me. And so I, rem I took classes. I've worked with individuals who are on the spectrum. I, I've worked for Autism Society. I've worked for Easter Seals. I've worked in CMS school system as a substitute teacher, as I can't think of the, the other job that I have with CMS. But I wanted, and, I, and I've also done ABA. So I wanted to learn all that I, I needed. And I just remember praying to God to allow me to be able to help my son and please guide me in the way that you would have me to go and meet the people that I would need to meet to help me along this journey. Because what I did know is that I couldn't do it by myself. And I had a good family base, my tribe. I talk about your tribe in my book. You have to have a tribe and you have to be able to trust other people. You have to trust because it does get difficult sometimes, but you have to stay in prayer. I'm just saying, you have to, because the journey, it's a journey. And my son taught me a lot. As I was teaching him, he taught me a lot. And what I got from it is patience. And I may not have patience for everyone, but I have patience for those kids who are on the autism spectrum. That's for sure. I agree 100% with everything that she spoke of and just being able to let my guard down and allowing my son to surprise me because, you know, you're given this diagnosis. And like she said, the doctors will tell you one thing, but your child is going to tell you what you need to know to be able to help them. But you have to listen. You have yes. to be observant. You have to be patient. And you also have to, as you advocate, as I learned to advocate my son, I was able to advocate for other people. Yes. and reach out to other people. And that's helping to kind of spread the awareness and letting people know that you're not alone because it gets exactly. very lonely yes. because none of my other friends will understand if they don't have a child with autism what I have to deal with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And I can laugh at it now, but it was hard going yes. through it. So um, patience, prayer, and just giving your child the space to be a child to because be you can't just force all the learning and you want them to read, you want them to write, you want, but you have to, it has, like you said, it will force you to put things in perspective. You have to allow them to go at their own pace. Mm -hmm. And I even, I, I don't, go ahead, I'm sorry. I want to say, and you also have to remember, it's not just a diagnosis of autism, but they have a personality too. So they come with the personality and you have to let that personality, mm -hmm. you have to let them show it, right? They're going to show you their personality, whether it's humorous, or you know, whatever it is, whether it's sarcastic, right? 
like they told me my kid wouldn't talk. Now he's talking. And, you know, sometimes I he, he asked me, you know, where are you going? Who are you going with? What time will you be back? <laughs> All these questions. And I say to him, hey, that lady told me you never know I left the room. Why are right. you asking me all these questions? Right. <laughs> and what I'd like to add is um, I'm not a parent of a child with a disability, but they have profoundly affected my life. Um, when I came out of college, I moved back home with my parents. I was like, this is not working. I just need to get out of the house. There was a job within reach where you could live in a group home. It was a live-in position. I was like, I'll take it for a couple <laughs> weeks till I find something else. I just need to get out of here. I was put in a situation where I was in a group home with six people that were, you know, you come out of college very self centered all about you, but you're put in a situation where, oh, I'm responsible for six other people. I got to make sure they're fed. They, they're they bathed. They got to get to bed, all, all of this. Um, but having said that, it, it became kind of my um, purpose in life and I've made a career out of it. And I'm still with the company 30 years later. But it's because I love this population. I um, I find joy in working with these folks, and I you know just thought I would share that because it is a, it, these are beautiful people with lots of skills and talents and um, yeah, love to share. So in a group home, absolutely not. Okay, um, okay. <laughs> uh, we have Tommy, and then our last person is Chris. Okay. Yeah, I, um, I had an opportunity to see Thomas Moore and myself. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. works. In nursing home, rest home, the convalescent so in the older adult program, since we came out. And one thing I noticed while I was in this position was that America has become dependent on medication. You know, like yeah. everybody take a pill. I don't care what it is, what mm -hmm. illness it is, they got a pill for everything. And I want to know has this changed some? Because a lot of people just need the That's pill they are pushing down their throat. Is, you know. Uh, so, are we working with individuals as individuals? Or are we just pushing pills? It's no, there's no pill for autism. Well, mm -hmm. in the nurse home, they give them sedatives and stuff. Yes, I've right. sat there and sedatives. You know, so, so, know, so nobody so, talk to them. Nobody can do anything. Um, what I can speak to is that there has been like a movement and like autism. natural remedies, natural therapies, going to the chiropractor. Um, yes. activity, exercise, yoga, things of that nature have become more prevalent because now we have more access because we have the mm -hmm. internet and because of the things that are right. able, the technology we have access to. So putting things in place like that, like my son has an app on his tablet that tells him to breathe, like teaches him how to take his breath and put his hands on his stomach. So now like at school, people say, well, yes, he uses this, this um, Relaxation. Just today, because he was getting excited mm -hmm. or had gotten anxious because of the stuff his hands to his stomach, he'll, he'll breathe What's and he'll this? slow, like learning to self regulate. So there's a lot more things in place now to kind of remedy some of those things so that you don't have to medicate, but it also depends on who's in charge of that person. Okay. Thank and the patients you have with that person to try from outside of medicate. Not that I'm going to get to medicating depending on what the needs of the child or the mm -hmm. individual, if there's mental health, things like that. So, And we try to do medication reviews and especially around psychotropics. We have um, those have to run through our HRC committee to make sure that psychotropics are appropriately prescribed and they're not being used as like a chemical restraint or anything like mm -hmm. that. So we try to monitor and keep people's medication regimens, you know, current and up to date and only what they need. Okay, great. Chris? Okay, Mary? Um, I was going to say that he's autistic and he is an artist. Mm -hmm. But his, I mean, he, I mean he's, he's in this program called Art Enables, and I don't know if you've heard of that. It's in the Washington, D.C. area. But they, it's a gallery kind of thing that they display art. Um, disabled adults, and most of them are autistic. But he has this little thing where he has to put a shoe in every one of his it is. pictures. Yeah. And I think that's just his <laughs> thing. I mean, yes. His, 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 that's his, his signature. Yeah. That's his signature. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. That's he his signature. shoe in everything. But, uh, and also, this is what I really want to ask, and I know this might be. But you know, there's a TV show on about a doctor who is yes. autistic. And I think a lot of us may have seen that show. Mm -hmm. Is that 
Well, some of his behaviors, I would say, he 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 de he definitely has them down, like his behaviors and and his sensory. And the mere fact that it seems like he talks in a monotone voice because either our kids they speak in monotone voices or flat voices, and he 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 really has. I would have to say the doctor because I think it's called the doctor. He the, doctor. the good doctor. I, he has really practiced for that role, and he's he, he's playing it well. And there's also a good book out there if you all want to read a book about a high functioning level one with level two tendencies kid. It's called House Rules by Jody Bacall. It's a really good book. You can listen to it on Amazon, or you can read it. It's really really good. What's the name of it again? House Rules. Oh, House Rules. Okay. Yes, by Jody Bacall. Now, did you get a book? Oh, your book, the name of your book. The name of my book is Spectrum of a Journey. Spectrum mm -hmm. of the Journey. Spectrum, Spectrum of a Journey. Of a Journey. Yes. We're working on putting, publishing it on Amazon this week. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes, it's, it's completed. Thomas. Just one more thing. Uh, the guy Al Darner that came up with uh, oh, alien intelligence, I yeah. and then there was some people who came up with even more intelligence. Yeah. One of the things that happens when two yeah, children are involved how, in music and yeah. singing and yeah, whatnot, how is sometimes it's related. It's more related to math. Sometimes it's, it's more related to science. Yeah. It's being able to. How do you make that it's high pitch services. that you are thinking of? And then, and then you sing it. And so some of what we need to think about is smart is, is about paying attention to who you're dealing with and figuring out how to deal with them. And a lot of what has happened with kids who are autistic, they are introducing you with, to a lot of other things that you, you normally wouldn't be thinking about. And so now you have developed some skills that we need as a society. We need to learn how to deal with all kinds of people. And you're, you're telling us how to deal with children with autism or adults with autism. And, and more, more input from you to help us because you have developed some more skills. The more I think we as a society can provide the resources. Absolutely. You know, that really works for everyone. Because we need to look at the ability instead of looking at the disability. Because right. mm -hmm. as you stated, math and science and music is where it's at for them. But my son, he plays music by ear. And he was good in math, but he didn't like it. And I just didn't understand. But, you know, he, he gets to choose. He, he, he likes to be grammatically correct. And that's, that's where it's at for him. But... You know, when you started, the first thing that you said, a child, a child is born, right? So that used to be my intro. I, I, I don't know if you all know this song, but a child was born with no state of mind, blind to the ways. So I had to man, you know, God is smiling on you. We found it too, because only God knows what we've been through, right? So that used to be my intro. So when you started out, I thought that's the way that you were going to go. I was like, <laughs> This has been wonderful. Okay, this has been wonderful. We want to thank you so much for. <laughs> Can I say one more thing? Yeah, yeah say one more thing. And let's talk about it, the autism center. We are keeping autism on the table and in the conversations because what we want is more people to be informed and know about autism because our kids are here to stay and they need some employment. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> We have an autism resource fair that will take place on May 6th at the Charlotte Lab School on South Tryon. And we have a bowling event coming, a bowling fundraiser coming up on April 29th at Valero and Matthews. Valero and Matthews. Could you send those events to Steve so he can put it on our website? Okay. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And exactly. anything in the future, any other activities that you have that you want the public to participate, yeah. would you send those in? 
both of you, all three of you. Okay. I was about to say we have a cornhole tournament this weekend at Lenny Boy Brewery. Yeah, so right. yeah. Okay. So uh, what kind of tournament? Cornhole. A and, cornhole. Oh, and I think a couple years ago we broke the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest cornhole tournament. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Really? But it's, it's a great like, event. Even as good at it's, cornhole. Yeah, it's, it's an event that uh, folks <laughs> oh, and, and, with disabilities can play in. Everybody can. Everybody's welcome. Okay. One, one more event I have is. Okay. No we're we <laughs> announcements now. So go. Ahead. My announcement, I, I am getting the opportunity to speak at the American with Disability Act Symposium in Kansas City, Missouri net in May oh, right. about autism and the police. Okay, we have another announcement. We have an announcement in the back. Okay. I just want to say hello. My name is Lisa Jewell, and I'm running for the North Carolina House of Representatives District 98 with the Davidson, Cornelius, and Huntersville. And if anyone would like to speak after, I'd love to talk to you all. Thank you. Okay. And this young man said, you said something about you wanted to say why you're here. Yeah, my, my name is Long Gone. I'm thinking about running for District 112. Uh, Trisha Cotham just split. So mm -hmm. I'm just here to gather information and I'm okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm a Democrat, Black Walker. Do it. Thank you very much. Norman Garns, G A R N. G A R N. Ken, do you have an announcement? No. Excuse <laughs> me, Mr. Garns. I wanted Garns to say who he is. That's Garns. what I was going to say. Uh, hey, I'm Norman Garns. I originally retired from CMP, the 20 year CMP. Uh, my father is Norman okay. Garns, Sr. Uh, he retired mm -hmm. from CMP. Yes. 2003. So we're the first African American father and son at the Charlotte Brook Police Department. Uh, so I, he did 25 years, I did 21 years. Uh, mm -hmm. I retired from the United States Army, retired as a service in 2011. Uh, husband, father, grandfather. I live in the district. Uh, Charlotte 10 went to Garinger. CMS is great. We have issues, but CMS is the bomb. Oh, great, great, great. Yeah. Uh, and the business on Bates Ford Road? Bates Ford Road, uh, independent tire, 3655 Bates Ford Road. Uh, matter of fact, right in front of Reed Memorial where the meeting with the Democrats was last night. 3655 Bates Ford Road, uh, right before the YMCA. Absolutely. He has the top. Uh, full service on the shop. Well, now that's a lot. You didn't tell us all that. <laughs> <laughs> and you did it quickly. That was good. Yeah. You did it real good. Okay, yes. I just wanted to share that my son also wrote a book about autism, about his his experience with his younger brother. It's called The Awesome Adventures of Autism with DJ Advance, and it is available on Amazon. Can you talk about the segment for a minute that was um, on W? We tried to get that segment, but we couldn't get it. He was interviewed so recently so on so Channel 9, yeah. um, and he discussed like what inspired him to write the book and how he wanted to bring more awareness, and he is also donating to the Autism Society, and he's donating to the ARC um, some of the profits from the book as well. Yeah. Does, uh, does the Autism Society have like a, a 5K anything? You know, a lot of groups have 5Ks. And no, they have a, I don't know about they, I'm, I'm just thinking of No, they just had a gala. Donate, you know. Oh, they just had a gala, I think, at the end of uh, March. Okay. Ken? Sir, uh, talk to me afterwards because you need to help your son to have a book signing at our time. Okay, absolutely. Wouldn't that be wonderful? We can do oh. mm. I want to thank everybody for coming today. Let's give these guys a great. Uh, any additional announcements can be given to Steve. She says she did say that. Thank you all. Yes. <laughs>